Welcome back to another recap episode with KLF. That is me, Kristen LaFrance. Good to uh, not so much see you, but be talking to you guys again. I know we missed last week, but not a lot of big news came out last week. My husband came home after being gone for 40 days, so I had about 40 days of house cleaning to do. You know, just regular stuff. So this week we're going to get back at it. And we still don't have any massive, crazy e-commerce D2C news, but there is some interesting news out there that kind of has connected some some ties in my brain and some thought patterns about ways that I've been thinking about commerce and questions that I've had about how a brand is supposed to succeed in this modern world of commerce. So I thought we'd kind of talk about a larger topic with a couple of new stories tied to it. And then, of course, go into some fun news because we need the good news in our life. So if you are looking at this episode's title, probably looks a little different than a normal news recap title, right? Really talking about invisible embedding, 100% a term I have now made up, but really talking about how the best brands are actually succeeding in today's economy and I think it comes down to this idea of brand equity and creating a universe around your brand and building in the intangibles and even getting past a lot of the this is how you do XYZ tactical conversations. We are really watching the biggest, biggest brands create a personality, a stance in our culture, in our society. And there's so many angles to this that we could talk about, but I think the question for me really becomes, how does that apply to a brand like yours? How does that apply to a brand that is not a company like a Costco or a Target that has to play in this minuscule game of attention when you don't have nearly as much capital, right? And the thing that I just keep coming back to, and I know I've said it multiple times here, is If you really look at these brands that we are referencing again and again as the best of the best, the ones innovating, doing cool stuff, really connecting with customers, building communities, building this quote unquote intangible universe or invisibly embedding themselves into our lives. What's the most interesting piece is each of these brands has a different customer market or customer profile. And so what is the commonality that allows them to embed themselves in the day-to-day cultural lives of their customer, right? So American Eagle versus Costco versus Black Rifle Coffee, completely different markets, except for the commonality is that they connect very deeply with their customers. They create campaigns specifically for their customers, and they have become such a part of their consumers' lives that, and this I think is very interesting, almost become invisible. So it's these two opposite things happening. You want to be embedded in your customer's life, but almost to a point where you're not actually having to show up actively all the time. It's just natural that when I go to the grocery store and I'm running low on toilet paper, I'm going to buy Charmin. And I don't even know why, but there's a lot of psychology happening in the back end. And I think that is the ultimate goal is to become a consumer's go-to without thought. So invisible embedding, brand equity within the intangibles, how the best brands are creating a universe. I know it all sounds very floaty, but I do think it is kind of the heart and soul of commerce and actually the newly non-negotiable that every brand has to play in whether you are the size of Walmart or you are a single founder running a small brand. It's the heart of everything that we do. So let's talk about two news stories that really made this thought come in my head and really really got me thinking and mulling on how to connect a brand universe to a D2C brand with 1% of the budget resources allocation reach Etc. of these big leader brands. So the first one is an article on Marketing Dive called Inside American Eagle's Tie-Up with the Summer I Turned Pretty. And yes, I had to look up the Summer I Turned Pretty because I am not Gen Z. But 
TLDR of this is it is an American Eagle campaign. And I don't know if you've noticed, but we've talked about American Eagle lots in this season so far because they are pushing the category forward and they are doing big moves and big changes and working to recreate the universe. A lot of us lived in when I was in middle school, high school, American Eagle was my go to. They're trying to recreate that for a new generation. So they are working with The Summer I Turned Pretty, which is an Amazon Prime video series. It's their second season this summer. They are working with them and the actors of that show to create an entire marketing community campaign along with a clothing connection. So the campaign launched last week on the 23rd, and they're talking about the human connection that a campaign like this is driving and human connection, I feel like, is often a buzzword that we mention, but ultimately means this intangible universe that somehow has become interconnected with the one that you live in your own brain, in your own life, in your home, in your spaces. So they are saying this this campaign is really meant to, quote, promote human connection and it's going to span in-store, digital properties, e-commerce, mobile app, and their creators and talent social media channels, along with TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. They have joined Lemon8 as well. They are taking this campaign and doing a full omni-channel blowout. And maybe we can also talk about the term omni-channel as being synonymous with a brand universe, being everywhere that the customer is in the right places with the right messaging without being annoying or too present, right? And now here's where we get to that cultural piece, that a brand universe must live within the culture of our society and within the culture of every specific customer, which is both the most broad and the most specific ask of a brand. And CMO Craig Brommers from American Eagle was quoted saying, the summer I turned pretty cast was a no brainer because he took notice of the quote, cultural impact on the younger generation when it debuted last year. Now taking two things into consideration, one, this is a CMO who understands the importance of being part of the culture of your target audience. And two, very important to notice that American Eagle is focusing on this younger generation, even if previously they were really focused on a younger generation that is now in their 30s. Also, he goes on to talk about kind of the series and the personality of the show and how that is related to American Eagle's branding, which sometimes these two dots can be very hard to connect as a small brand, especially with a limited skew count. But They talk about how this series has a sense of optimism and that really connects to American Eagle's branding. So the campaign was designed with the goal of boosting the mood for Gen Z. Brommer goes on to say, quote, it's about us again. It's about getting together. It's about the human connection they were all craving, but certainly Gen Z is craving. And then he goes on to describe this focus on streaming video content, full-blown campaigns as Gen Z, quote, passion pillars. I think these passion pillars really talk about how American Eagle is doing this top-down, bottom-up approach. Everything from where they're advertising to how they're merchandising to the brands that they're partnering with to their approach to creators is really trying to make sure that wherever you are in the universe of American Eagle, as long as you are in this orbit that they're targeting, there's going to be somebody that's going to speak to you in a way that does not feel invasive. It doesn't feel disconnected. It feels invisibly embedded into who you are and why you would shop with them. Another one that is along the same lines, and also probably my favorite story of the day, if not the season so far, Wendy's, another great example of a brand who has created an entire personified brand, universe, cultural movement, everything from their approach to Twitter and the sarcastic 
voice that they use across a lot of their marketing down to, again, how they pick partnerships, how they pick new menu items to come out, how they pick new tech to work with. They have officially teamed with T-Pain as a part of a campaign around the return of the Strawberry Frosty. Part of this campaign, they have dubbed T-Pain Frost T-Pain and has remade his 2007 hit, Buy You a Drink. I don't know about any other millennials, but I'm feeling very old that that came out in 2007. And it is about the frosty flavor. It is on their YouTube. I will make sure it is linked in our show notes. T-Pain has really tapped into kind of nostalgic commercial plays with his name, his voice, his likeness. Also, as somebody who saw him in concert within the last six months, dude still got it. But this is another example of Wendy's really understanding a broad universe that their brand lives in. So different consumers can connect with this, react to it, engage with Wendy's on it, and really create this exciting, loyal connection to Wendy's beyond just going and getting fries and a frosty and spicy chicken nuggets on Friday night when you're in high school. But I think it's just an example of a tactic that a lot of times a small e-commerce based brand can look at and go, cool, if I could only contact T-Pain, then I could be just as successful as them. And it's bringing it into a zoomed out picture to say, you can do something like this so long that you understand your audience, you understand your target market, and you understand the goal of brand and how it differs from just the business tactics and just the metrics. Often when we refer to brands as pure consumers, not connected to the business space, we're talking about things that have just become part of our life, right? We don't ever say, I'm going to go ride my Peloton bike. We're going to go ride the Peloton. We're not going to go to an REI store. We're just going to REI. It's a way to kind of make yourself think about being something bigger, even if you are supplying a product in a niche market or a niche skew set. You can still create this loyalist cultural vibe for your brand. With these big stories, I wanted to take a moment and make sure we really did connect it back to being relatable to a brand like yours. I wanted to talk to somebody who actually is operating in this space, who both believes this idea of invisible embedding or brand universe or brand equity within intangibles and make it a little more tangible. And so I went to my friend, Erica Ahrens, and Erica has worked at many consumer brands. She was the director of marketing at Rexpex, retention manager at Rumpel. Now she is freelancing as a retention expert for lifestyle and consumer brands all across the board which ultimately means this is the person who is operating on the theory that we just talked about. So I came straight to her and I said, Erica, here's the idea that I'm thinking about, but how does a brand that is not Walmart, not Target, actually execute this idea of building personification across multiple channels and showing up where you need to be, how you need to be with the thing you need to be, my question said, how? Is it luck? Is it timing? Is it about just product? Is it the founder story? Is it the stance the brand is making? Is it the emails you're sending? Is it the tools that you're using? Is it the platform that you're on? And she had such a fantastic answer that we're going to jump right on over to Erica. You're absolutely correct, Kristen. It's about creating a wireless and every size company can. But let's get back to the how. It's really not a three-step process that is easily replicated because if it was, I think everyone would be doing it. No two brands or people are the same and each consumer connects differently. So the how is really dependent on your brand, your target demographic, and your stance. If there's one tactical piece I know is non-negotiable, honestly, it's about hiring the people who are the brand and letting them show up authentically as the brand as well. Whether it's the social media manager, customer service manager, email specialist. The people behind the brand should be empowered to show themselves through the brand until consumers feel comfortable to start showing up too. In simple terms, you really have to give the consumer permission to be a loyalist. And that starts by leading by example. 
the internal operations have to match the external universe you're building, period. And unsurprisingly, we've come back to a common theme, which is commerce is about human beings, humanity, moving society forwards and reflecting on how society is moving. And I think sometimes we get so, so zoomed into the channels and the tactics and the tools that we forget how important the why actually is. Because the why feels floaty. It feels non-tactical. It feels uncopy and pasteable. You can't just become the next Patagonia. But maybe at the end of the day, our challenge as brands is actually a lot more similar or identical to our challenge as human beings. How can I be someone who automatically gets added to any new group text or to automatically get the party invite within my circle? How can I make the connection real and yet autonomous at the same time? Modern brands, especially e-commerce first or D2C focused brands, have such an interesting challenge right now where it's absolutely imperative to have both visionary and executionary prowess without losing too much of either. And I'm sure this month we'll come around and talk more in depth about this with an expert on the topic, but I do think it is part of the core obstacle that brands like Target, North Face, and Bud Light are facing with LGBTQ plus and Pride Month merchandising. Ultimately, the obstacle becomes a disconnect between visionary and executionary. And that can lead to short-sighted decisions, fear-based reactions, and ultimately deep rifts within the brand. And I do think it's something that will be consistently making the news and highlighted as culture, society, commerce, government, and social progress all have different goals and ultimatums and yet all reflect back on commerce. So I think we're in the midst of a crossroads of how commerce shows up in our cultural future. And while this is a very scary and intensely large topic, and no matter where you stand on it, I think you do have to admit we're getting to a very unique place where as brand operators and founders, we are getting a peek into real-time reality shifts. Just something to think about. This is ultimately why I do love commerce. It's a large reflection on who we are in a bigger sense, but it also creates a lot of new challenges for brands. Okay, now on to our quick, fun news. From Morning Brew, the perfume industry is up 60% from pre-pandemic levels. I love this headline. I love this stat. I love this trend. I love that Morning Brew goes on to say, is the boom because we all smell bad? Maybe it's just me. I definitely smell like a teenage boy, but... They talk about a phenomenon dubbed the lipstick effect. Beauty brands have historically seen an uptick in sales when shoppers tighten their budgets elsewhere. So consumers love splurging. It feels good. There's a literal chemical reaction that happens in our body when we're able to feel like we've bought ourselves something special. And when we can no longer afford to buy a new car because they're ridiculously expensive, we start to see consumers splurge on things like makeup and perfume. Up next, YouTuber Emma Chamberlain, also founder of Chamberlain Coffee, adds to her coffee empire with a ready-to-drink line. Just this week, Chamberlain Coffee announced a $7 million raise in additional funding and an expanded retail presence in Sprouts and Walmart. You're hearing lots of themes that we've talked about this season, right? Funding, omni-channel, retail, but also product expansion. So last month, they launched their ready-to-drink line of cold brew lattes. Now they're taking them to market with this new round of funding. Congratulations to Chamberlain Coffee and Emma Chamberlain, one of the best examples of a creator-led brand who has the vision and the operation to become successful. Lastly, if you are listening to this episode on the day it came out, Friday, June 2nd, it is National Donut Day. And you can go to Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts and get free donuts. Thank you so much for catching up with me again this week. We will see you soon. All the links are on our show notes.